Hello, Chelan County. I am Lacey Stockton, and this is Layla. Layla. This is my daughter, Layla, in honor of Take Your Kid to Work Day on April 28th. Layla here will be helping me host live from Lake Chelan Chamber of Commerce, and our guests are just across the street at the Chelan Earth Day Fair, which is happening today until 4 p.m., and we have lots of cool gifts that help you save energy and water because that's how we roll around here. And we also have five special guests with us in addition to this one who are going to explain their work around Lake Chelan and how they are making it a better place, not just on Earth Day, but year round. Welcome. Kind of an awkward harsh one hey tammy so tammy Hi. where are you well i'm at the earth day fair going on right now at the park in chelan and um, as you can see behind me there are lots of booths lots of people we've had a great turnout even though the weather is not quite as warm as it has been in the past but it's still a wonderful place to come so please come down awesome and I am so grateful for you to join us today. You are one of the magical little elves that make this fantastic day possible. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do with the Earth Day Fair and what you've brought with you today? Well, um, I'm the garden coordinator and I've been doing this for several years now. And Earth Day, um, we, we have plants. We have lots of bedding plants, tomatoes, peppers, um, different kinds of squash, all kinds of things that are um, almost ready to go into your garden. When the weather cooperates, we'll be able to plant all that stuff into our gardens here soon. And um, and we have repeat customers every year. They come down here and they look for the plants um, and you know to grow in their gardens. And with the way things are going, a lot of people are gardening and and just loving it. So yes. Yeah. Tomatoes have never tasted better than from your own plant. Exactly, especially those heirlooms. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Tammy, what would be your favorite edible plant that grows easily in our area? Oh, well, that's a great question. Um, I like nasturtiums. They um, are very tasty, very colorful. They look great on a salad plate. Um, they are early, you know, in this cold weather, you could probably start your nasturtiums right now and, and have beautiful flowers in your garden as well as things that you could put on your salad plate. Do you know what's super funny? We were walking just over from where you are over back here and Layla says, hey, what are those, what are those flowers we put on our salad? Because I want to talk about those. Aw. <laughs> so you so grow nasturtiums, Layla. Nasturtiums are happening. We also really like arugula, which seems to be a perennial at our house. Oh, it good. started in a section and we don't water it at all. It's just like kind of in the shade of a cherry tree and it has taken over in five years. And so we don't, it's like the ultimate carefree edible. That's awesome. Yes. We like those carefree yeah, ones that absolutely. reseed themselves, right? <laughs> totally. All right. And so tell us a little bit more. I mean, how long have you been doing Earth Day? Well, you know, I was thinking about that. I'm not really sure. It's been at least 12 years. Um, of course, we missed the last few years, but um, I'm glad it's back again because I've missed seeing the people. I always think of Earth Days as the place, as the time when everyone comes out of the woodwork. You know, we've been hibernating all winter and now we get together, we get to see all our friends and um, just enjoy the day. And Earth Day is kind of special. I, I honestly don't remember how long it's been going, 30s, 5, 30, help me out there, 30s. Six years. Didn't it start in the 70s? It has been a long time and it and it has not missed a year. Like even though the last couple of years it was virtual, but um, other than that, dedicated, dedicated people. Um, 
I, I can't even remember the names of all the people that started it, but just so dedicated. And Anne and Randy Brooks have just kept it going. Um, so many great people on the committee and they just, they work really hard. They start, um, actually they never stop. Every month they meet, they um, just coordinate so well. And it's just a really fun committee to be on. And, and then they put this amazing event together and we have just all different kinds of booths. It's just, it's wonderful. And, and yeah, a place to meet and, and reconnect after the winter. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I wanted to dive a little bit, you know, this show, the power hour, normally we talk about saving energy, but we're into conservation of all kinds. And I know that water in the desert can be a really uh, quick way to waste, <laughs> to waste a resource that we have. Very um, true. So you're a gardening guru. What kind of tips do you have for folks who might be looking out there? It's spring looking at their yard and thinking this year, I'm going to get out there, plant some plants. What would you say in terms of planning for conservation in their yard? Um, well, that's a great question. We, we live in a time where we um, have a lot of resources as far as um, drip lines, um, drip tapes, rather than just overhead watering, which is drip lines are better for your garden anyway, and they soak in quickly. You don't have all the waste of overhead watering. And I mean, we are very, very fortunate that we live in a valley where we have this beautiful, beautiful lake. So a lot of people have irrigation, but still drip lines, I would highly recommend drip lines, but you can also um, get garden mulch and put that down over top of, of your plants down your rows and that can help um, conserve water as well. Yeah, absolutely. So everything in the valley, in Chelan Valley drains to the lake. Is that accurate? I would, I would probably guess so. I mean, the earth does a wonderful job of taking care of, of, um, you know, I mean, the, that's dirt helps to absorb chemicals and, and nasty things that we don't really want before it gets into the lake. But sometimes it just goes straight to the lake. So we want to be very careful. Um, we definitely promote organic gardening. Um, my husband gets kind of upset with me when I'm out at 12 o'clock at night killing bugs because that's the best time to squish your bugs at midnight. Just on a headlamp. <laughs> well, I guess you don't have to wait till midnight, but dark. And you go out and squish your bugs with a headlamp, and that's the best time. Um, I know that's not feasible for everybody, but um, it, it works for us because we do like to garden organically. And we will use neem oil once in a while, which is a natural um, pesticide, but we don't want to get rid of our ladybugs and our praying mantis either. So we just have to be careful. And so squishing bugs at midnight, it's become a pastime <laughs> of mine. <laughs> <laughs> that's a real pro tip. I like that. So why midnight? Yeah. Because that's when all the bugs come out or? Um, well, you know, as soon as, yeah, usually between 11 and 12, they like to have their little parties on my plants. So. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> All right, cool. I'm learning something. <laughs> and so for those who are watching the live stream, uh, so one thing, you can totally come down and ask questions as well of our guests today. But if you have any questions for Tammy or our other guests, just type them into the chat. I can see them and we can ask her any of your gardening questions or anything else. Um, Layla, did you have another question? Mm. About gardening? No, you're just happy that nasturtiums were mentioned? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. you're going to be a good future gardener. <laughs> yeah, uh, so far our brambles have really been the easiest thing. Besides the feral arugula and our semi-feral brambles, um, our garden hasn't always worked out super well, I have to say. Um, <laughs> garlic's also been a hit. I think in general, alliums have worked for us because I hear you about setting up irrigation and things like that. But sometimes, you know, you like go camping and you come back and right. uh, tomatoes just don't really like that kind of up and down of watering um, in the same way that like alliums like garlic and chives and onion. They don't mind that. Exactly. They're very hardy. Yeah, absolutely. 
All right, great. Is there anything else that you wanted to share today? Because um, is Amanda there as well? Amanda, Amanda, I'm not sure. Is Amanda here? Oh, there's Amanda. Yes. Okay, cool. Is she your next guest? She is our next guest, but I didn't want to cut off any of your awesome messages for us. So please. Well, I will just maybe show a picture here of everything that's going on. And as you can see, all the different booths. I mean, there's just so many. The park is, there's a lot of people just filtering in and out. There's great entertainment and it goes on till four o'clock, like you said. So thank you, Lacey and Layla. It was nice to meet you. Yeah, thanks for coming, Tammy. We'll see you after after we're done on the Power Hour. That's good. Come over and ask me some more questions, Layla. I'd love to help you. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Talk to you later. <laughs> thanks. Bye. All right. Our next guest is Amanda Newell from the Cascadia Conservation District. Hey, Amanda. Hi. Can you hear us How are okay? You? Yeah. I love your scarf. This is really cute. Thank you. Thought I was done with winter gear for the year, but apparently not. <laughs> nope. Nope. You know, I I don't know. Where where do you live? Uh, do you I live, live in Leavenworth. So okay. we've had so snow you guys all week long. <laughs> yeah. Definitely got snow. <laughs> I actually have this great photo, though, on Thursday at 9 a.m. It looks like it's January. And then at 3 p.m., it looks like it's May. <laughs> Just like... We went from, you know, winter to spring in a few hours. But yeah, that's totally. the spring in the Pacific Northwest. So I love the season. So I guess I shouldn't complain. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're, we're just along for the ride anyway. Like there's exactly. nothing to do about it. <laughs> nope. <laughs> All right, cool. Can you tell us a little bit about what the Cascadia Conservation uh, District does? Sure. So we work with local landowners to manage natural resource concerns on private property, and we're a uh, non-regulatory grant-funded organization. We work throughout Chelan County. Um, we have a, a board of supervisors that kind of directs our work, and then we have technical staff that, um, that work co collaboratively with those local landowners and community members um, to implement conservation projects um, that include water resources, um, forestry, forest health and wildfire preparedness. Uh, we do salmon recovery work and riparian restoration. Um, I personally, I'm the education and outreach specialist for Cascadia. So I run our youth education programs and um, come to fun events like this to reach out to the community and share what we do and um, find out how we can help folks. We've got a little something for everyone. We also do some urban agriculture um, type programs. So uh, yeah, we try to have something for everyone. Um, feel free to reach out to us anytime and uh, we're happy to talk through any conservation or natural resource concerns you have. And um, we've got uh, a salmon safe program that's real active and I was excited to see one of our farms out here, Chelan Beauty. Uh, so make sure to check them out if you're around the fair today. They've got organic apples and cherries and blueberries um, and some really nice little lavender uh, sachets that I was excited about. So, yeah. Wow. Cool. Yeah, and it's really early on the range of things. Here. Yeah, to get all this, like, local produce. That's great. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, Amanda, what work? is Cascadia Conservation District doing by Lake Ch Chelan? By Lake Chelan, yeah. So I mentioned the Salmon Safe program, and that's pretty active. Um, we're actually going to have a farm tour in May. I believe it's the 26th um, that will be related to the Salmon Safe program. And so it'd be a, a great opportunity for producers to learn more about that. We actually help um, farmers and orchardists get through the certification process and pay any related fees. So if anyone's interested in learning more about that, um, Elizabeth Jackson in our office would be the best person to talk to. And then um, the Chelan School Districts do participate in some of our youth education programs. So we're always excited to see them coming out. Uh, we do a lot of forestry work and um, wildfire preparation type work in the Chelan area and throughout the, the county. Uh, but we do have a chipping program coming up. The sign up is still open until April 30th. So if you go onto our website, there's information on that and a registration form. 
Um, and anyone in Chelan County can participate, but uh, we've had a, a lot of folks from Chelan and Manson specifically um, be part of that program. So, and we also have Firewise communities in the Chelan area because of that program. Mm, okay, so what's a Firewise community? So a Firewise community, it's um, it can either be a community that already has an HOA and so they're more of an established one, um, or it can just be a group of neighbors that want to get together and create um, a Firewise community on a smaller scale. And the, the idea is that the neighbors would um, help prepare their neighborhood for um, wildfires to come through the area. So that wildfire preparedness piece again, um, creating defensible space around homes. They, um, they get together and do work parties. Um, they host a Firewise Day every year. So again, that could be a work party or just a get together where they do some planning for the upcoming year. They can participate in our chipping program. Um, some of the communities have gone out and gotten grant funding for their own chipping programs, just specific to their community. Um, also then fuels reduction work within the community. So a, a lot of different things. It's just a way um, to organize several neighbors um, to to prepare their homes for, for wildfire potential versus just individual landowners here and there throughout the community. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense because you could do the best job on the planet, but if all of the neighbors around you are just a big fuel source, it probably won't end well. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I really like how um, over the last you know couple of decades, I think we've started to re recognize like wildfire is a thing. Mm -hmm. It's not going anywhere. It's always been a part of the place where we live. And so the question becomes like, how can we adapt to live with it instead right. of, you know, trying to fight it or stop it, which has caused a lot of the problems that we're seeing now because there's just so much more foliage and stuff right. that can be burned because we, prevented it from burning when it was a lot smaller. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, there's a great uh, presentation called The Era of Megafun by Dr. Paul Hesberg, and he talks a lot about um, you know the history of the forests in our area and about the, um, the forest management over the years and then kind of what um, some potential solutions are moving forward, but um, it's available just online if you Google Era of Megafires. And um, I think that gives folks a really good idea of what's going on in our area and um, some steps that we can take to reduce our risk. And then um, Department of Natural Resources, we partner with them for a Wildfire Ready Neighbors program. And that is going on right now. Um, folks can sign up to have an expert come around to their house and do a um, home fire risk assessments. So they'd walk around with the landowner and identify some areas where they have um, potential for wildfire damage and just work with them on coming up with solutions. Um, it may be something as simple as limbing up some trees or maybe there's a few trees that need to be taken down. It's, um, it's very personalized to that landowner um, versus just kind of giving broad um, advice like we would, you know, uh, out at an event like this, you, you really get that one on one perspective. So uh, if anyone's interested in that, they can sign up through our website, CascadiaCD.org, or um, through the Washington Department of Natural Resources, their Wildfire Ready Neighbors program. Cool. That's a great resource. That's one question that, you know, I, so I get a lot of questions related to air quality. Because when we talk about saving energy, one of the things yeah. in summer is it gets hot and smoky, sometimes at the same time, which is not ideal because you don't want to have like a window AC that's bringing in all of this wildfire smoke, which is really toxic into your home. But you also want to stay cool. So we've talked about that in the past. Um, but I like that there's this other piece of it where, you know, looking outside your home, thinking about how we can change our landscapes to also sort of reduce the amount of fuels and perhaps contain a little bit of the wildfires, at least on that, more in the urban space or where we have homes. That makes a lot of yeah, sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the tipping program is another great way to, you know, get rid of those fuels that are causing fire potential, but without, um, you know, adding to air quality issues. Yes. Yeah, instead of just burning all of your waste, your yard waste, yeah. <laughs> you have, so it's just a little, just a little trailer that the conservation district will bring to your property. You don't even have to like 
you don't have to load it up right and drag yeah. it over like you guys go to people's houses and their properties and provided they have you know appropriate little organized wood piles you'll chip it and leave them with this fantastic mulch at the yeah, end of it exactly. that they can use to prevent all of the moisture in their soil from evaporating so exactly yeah couldn't have said it better myself <laughs> okay. yeah, that's great. we try to make it as easy as we can for folks to participate and um yeah, so it, if anyone's interested in hearing more about that program, definitely reach out to us. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, and this is specifically for Chelan County residents, is we are hosting, um, along with the City of Chelan, free yard waste disposal days uh, at the transfer station. That is May 6th and 7th. It's a Friday and Saturday. And again, that's where's, only for Chelan residents. Where's the transfer station? It is it's kind of out towards Walmart of across from that Walmart um, traffic light okay. there. So May 6th, May 7th, if folks have yard waste that's not, you know, chipper quality, but they want to get rid of it besides just igniting it on fire, <laughs> they can yeah. bring it to the transfer station. And what will happen to it there? They will work their magic with it. I, <laughs> I can tell you exactly what. Okay, honest, cool. But no, I think they mix it in it. with some of the other waste in it. it kind of helps things decompose, but um, yeah, the, the transfer station folks could answer that in better detail than I could. Okay, sorry, I'm asking. I really like asking questions about where did it come from and what's away? Yeah. Because as we yeah. know, throwing things away is in a real place. <laughs> right, exactly, yeah. Speaking of, is Julie around by chance? She is, I will oh. pass me on to her. Okay, cool. Is there anything else that you want to share with us today, Amanda? I'm so grateful for you to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, just to reiterate that, you know, we've got a little something for everyone. So reach out to us or peruse our website, Facebook page. Uh, we look forward to connecting with the community now that we're all able to get back out and in person together. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. It was great seeing thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you too. All right. Bye. All right. Our next guest is Julie McCoy from 911 Glass Rescue and the Lake Chelan Rotary. Hi, Julie. Hi. How are hey, you? Hey, how are you? I'm, uh, I've been at work, so I'm a little, I'm a little tired, work? but I'm here. <laughs> okay, yeah. well, thanks for taking your lunch break with us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've been crushing glass all morning. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. when did, when was the inaugural crush? Oh, the inaugural crush was in July. I believe it was July the 10th. So we've okay. been at it for a while now. And uh, we've really perfected our art, I think. <laughs> We're much more efficient. And uh, mostly everybody has a good time out there. Is it like, can you get a little stress relief? Like, do you, can you like throw the bottles into oh. the mouth? Or? Yes, there's nothing like <laughs> crushing glass for stress relief. Yes, okay. it's very cathartic. Okay, great. <laughs> so why don't you explain what we are making jokes about so that everyone can come in on our inside joke here. That's fair. Okay, so 911 Glass Rescue is a community service of the Lake Chelan Rotary Club. Our club here has been active for many years in a number of community service projects from uh, pocket parks around the community to we do wheelchair ramps and handrails for um, the elderly and disabled year round. Um, so we're really, that is, is one of our main missions is serving our community. And then um, I think it was 2018, the city took away the opportunity for uh, residents to recycle their glass. And there was a huge um, public outcry about that because people here actually were very well trained and very diligent about taking their glass out uh, to the recycle center for recycling. Um, so we saw that need and we started looking at how we might uh, meet it. And we eliminated a number of prospects that involved um, shipping glass to a distant location. In our case, uh, the Seattle area has a large, uh, what's called a cullet processor, which is a, an entity that makes the glass into a form that can then be used by a glass manufacturer and made into new glass bottles and jars. Because 
we are so far away from the Seattle area and the entity there um, would not pay for our glass or any of the transportation costs. Uh, it just, that was a non-starter from a sustainability uh, perspective. And we didn't like the carbon footprint associated with uh, shipping glass, you know, three and a half hours away. So we started looking around for a way that we might repurpose glass into other products, uh, specifically in our case, sand and aggregate. And we found um, a company out of upstate New York, Richfield Springs, New York, been in business about 25 years, and they make state-of-the-art glass pulverizing equipment. Uh, hmm. It's called Andela Products. Uh, so we ended up um, buying, with the help of the city of Chelan and the uh, Department of Ecology, we ended up buying a pulverizing system that turns uh, glass bottles and jars into sand and aggregate. Uh, all of it has rounded edges, so it's really uh, nice to handle. Uh, we're selling the product uh, for $5 per five gallon bucket. We're getting huge traction. We sold uh, 10 buckets today. Every time we work, uh, we sell some product and people are liking it. It's a, it's a really nice end product. So we're, We've solved a local problem with a local solution, and we feel good about that. <laughs> That's great. That totally makes sense. Um, well, Julie, what made you focus on glass recycling? Um, the demand in the in the community, actually. Um, people were calling into uh, Cozy, uh, the local radio station, and complaining very loudly about having to a lot of people who were taking their glass back to the west side when they mm -hmm. would go to visit um, relatives and people were quite unhappy about it. So yeah, it's, it, the process started actually with a couple of Manson High School students, Megan Clausen and Devin Smith, and they bought a little single bottle crusher. So this <laughs> thing did one bottle at a time so just to put that in perspective, today, this morning, we did 4,500 pounds of glass. That's 4,500 wine bottles that we yeah, did a in a couple of hours, <laughs> right? I'm it's not joking, just saying. <laughs> it's a lot. So yeah, so that process was pretty painful. That little machine is still in Megan's uh, parents' garage, but we <laughs> said, we need something a little bit more efficient. <laughs> So, so that's how we got into the Andela products machine, which does, by contrast, one to two tons per hour. So oh. it's pretty fast. It's one of their smaller machines, if you can believe that, but it, it's good for our purposes. Huh. Okay, cool. And what, do, what are you doing with all the aggregate, all of the glass sand that's coming out of it? There are so many potential uses um, under the uh, Washington Department of Transportation um, requirements. Glass can be up to 20% of a number of different construction applications. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be used in asphalt. Um, it can be used mixed with uh, cement. It uh, has a great, um, it's a great landscaping product because glass, uh, unlike mined sand and aggregate, Glass has a negative charge that attracts water. So around here in our dry environment, um, putting the glass around your plants helps to keep the moisture there. And it also repels insects because it functions, there's a product out called diatomaceous earth that a lot of people who, who you're not eating, so you know, yeah, so I lived in Southern California where snails were a huge problem and I gardened with diatomaceous earth. Well, this stuff has the same our sand has the same properties, yeah. but it's completely renewable. I mean, yeah. as long as we have wineries, and I think right. well. <laughs> Yeah. When, I'm curious, though, why don't the wineries take back their bottles? You know, that's a great question. So um, it would require a change in legislation. They're not really allowed to re-bottle with, uh, with the same bottles. So there's really yeah. nothing to do but to discard it and that was that is what happens in this country every year in the u.s alone nine to eleven million tons of glass is disposed of and mostly ends up in the landfill where of course it um it just sits it takes about one to two million years for glass to decompose so it is forcing the early retirement of landfills 
Sure. Yeah, it's just taking up a lot of space that it doesn't need to when it could be bothering insects that are trying to eat your your produce. <laughs> it could be doing that. Yep. Cool. Huh. All right. Do you, could you tell me a little bit more about Lake Win uh, Lake Chelan Rotary and kind of your work there? I know that you guys sponsored a project, a couple of projects actually, where you were helping um, Lake Chelan thrive throw out their old windows and replace them with energy efficient windows. Is that something that is common with your projects or what kind of projects are you doing up there? I, I would say that that the environmental focus is real common with the exception of 911 glass rescue. The, the projects tend to be more service to the community via like Singleton Park. You're going to talk to Brian Patterson next and he was very involved in the single Singleton Park Playground up in Manson. So that was a big project of, I believe, I think it was last year. You'll, you'll have to ask Brian that. But yeah, so we do like a lot of pocket parks throughout the community. And like I said, wheelchair ramps and, and guardrails, handrails. Okay. All right. No, that's really helpful to make our community more accessible and more fun. I like, I like that piece. That's right. great. Well, yeah. is Brian around? Would he be willing he to talk about these parks? I'm sure he is. he's standing right here. Do you want to talk to him? Sure. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with us today, Julie? Well, okay. Yeah, I do need to share our hours of operation. So we're we're at the Chelan Recycle Center through a partnership with the city of Chelan. We operate every Saturday morning from nine to noon. There is no drop off of glass. You can't leave it there, but you can come during our hours, nine to noon on a Saturday morning. We have lots of volunteers who are ready to take your glass and we charge a very modest fee, two cents a pound. So for reference, a wine bottle weighs about one pound. So most people who drop off glass don't uh, pay us more than a couple of dollars and then they leave us a tip because we are a 501c3 <laughs> nonprofit entirely run by volunteers. So it's a pretty amazing effort. So come see us. Cool. Yeah. And you get to throw wine bottles. <laughs> That's right. You can throw stuff. Break yeah. stuff. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so yeah. much, Julie. I really appreciate yeah. you being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, see ya. Bye. I'll get you, Brian. Thank you. You bet. All right. So our next guest is Brian Patterson with the Lake Chelan Conservancy. It sounds like he's going to be chatting about uh, the parks that Julie mentioned. Hi, Brian. Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. How are you doing? Good. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. Julie yeah. mentioned that uh, you had your hand in creating a new park up in Manson. Is that true? Well, yes, sort of. Um, <laughs> so this is one of the things that uh, Chelan Basin Conservancy has kind of really been focused on is it turns out that uh, when they raised the lake level due to the dam, uh, roughly 1930, um, a lot of the roads went underwater, uh, not surprisingly. Well, all those roads still have a legal right of way associated with them that belongs to the public. And and so what we really advocated for is due to the fact that the majority of the uh, lakeshore and for Chelan is privately owned and it's pretty hard to come by new public property um, for, for the public to be able to access the lake, uh, why not use these street ends as a, a means of getting into the lake? So out in Manson, uh, we've got about a half a dozen of these kind of legacy street ends that go into the lake. And um, actually just through volunteers, um, one has already been cleared out on Bennett Road out there. And we're looking at a second one on uh, Kettle Kassoon, if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and so we're gonna have a volunteer work party come out there and uh, clear away some brush and just kind of open it up so that a few people will be able to go in and if they want to go swimming or bring their kayak or whatever. Cool. I love that idea. It's like reclaiming public space. Exactly. That's great. Cool. What other things does Lake Chelan, uh, sorry, I keep calling it Lake Chelan Conservancy. You, I'm, I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. Ah, okay. Land Basin Conservancy, although I'm assuming the basin like ends in the lake and there is a correlation, <laughs> but I'm sorry for, for botching your name. No, no, no problem. Yeah, Chelan Basin Conservancy, uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. It was established um, uh, roughly 10 years ago. 
I uh, was very focused on a single issue at the time. This was way before my time with them. Um, but that uh, issue, and that was related to the three fingers uh, fill in the lake, um, was resolved uh, through legal action in 2018. So since then, we've kind of been reinventing uh, Chelan Basin Conservancy and uh, because we really think it's important for this area to have uh, a, an environmental group that uh, can advocate on behalf of the public uh, for a variety of things. And so over the last two or three years, we've been focused primarily on three different things. And one is the, la the lake access, and that's primar primarily revolved around these street ends. Um, another is just preserving the lake itself in terms of water quality and aquatic invasive species. And there, we're not the only group obviously that is doing this. And so we partner with Keep It Blue and Lake Chelan Research Institute. Um, I also sit on the uh, technical board for Lake Chelan Research Institute. Um, so we're focused on that around Chelan. If you see these clean, dry drain signs around, which are encouraging boaters to make sure, especially if they've come from another water body, to make sure that their boat has been clean, you know, you know the water, any water in it drained out, because you don't want to carry invasive species over, you know, from another water body. Anyway, Chelan Basin Conservancy put up those signs around the area. And then the third area uh, uh, has to do with um, old orchard lands in this area. So back in the first half of the 20th century, um, lead arsenate was used as a pesticide in all the orchards here. Everybody was using it. They just didn't really know any better at the time. And unfortunately now that's left all those lands contaminated with lead and arsenic. And so um, we've worked with uh, the Department of Ecology and they've now developed a new program basically to ensure that people uh, when they go to redevelop these orchard lands, put uh, residential housing on there, um, that they're protecting themselves and future residents from um, contamination there. So those kind of historically, you know, over the last several years have been what we focused on. And now we're kind of looking at a fourth area, which has to do with the Chelan Butte here. And <clears throat> there's about 900 acres currently for sale up on the Chelan Butte you know, which we all love to see in its natural state, you know, as it sits in the, as a backdrop to Chelan right now. Um, well, those 900 acres, the majority of those are actually zoned for tourist accommodations. And so a lot of people here may be familiar with the lookout uh, development, which is all uh, mostly second homes, you know, vacation homes. Well, you could put two lookouts up there on Chelan Butte. Uh, it's zoned for 800 homes. And so what we'd really like to see is instead of that land being developed, have it be conserved uh, in some way, shape or form through a land trust, through the city of Chelan. Um, so we've spoken with the uh, Trust for Public Land, uh, trying to get their insights on how this might be possible to do. Um, so those are kind of the four things that Chelan Basin Conservancy has been focused on. And we're just a kind of grassroots, uh, relatively small organization um, going into today, we had about 30 members. I uh, already picked up eight new ones today, so we're hopefully- Wow, it's a recruiting out. event. <laughs> yep. That's great. Um, um, Brian, um, is lead arsenic toxic? Um, yeah, so uh, unfortunately, uh, lead arsenic, um, well, it was used as a pesticide, so it was toxic insects um, unfortunately it's toxic to human beings as well and so both lead and, and arsenic um, which are the two elements that uh, it's comprised of um, have very bad health effect human beings um, lead, lead is, is it stunts development um, and these and things like that. So we really keep children away from that. And arsenic is a carcinogen, which means it causes cancer in humans. So we just want to minimize contact between uh, people and these ground. And Department of Ecology has developed some very uh, straightforward methodologies for uh, basically isolating that contaminated soil from contact with humans. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like there's a couple ways to remediate or to deal with it. <laughs> and 
Uh, one of them is that you can kind of create a, a barrier and then bring in different soil in your yard so that there's sort of a separation because the issue with it is that it, it's not water soluble, right? It, once it's there, it just hangs out there indefinitely. Correct. Well, by so, you know, they're both uh, chemical elements, so they don't decompose in any way, shape or form. And then, yes, it turns out that they have a very strong affinity for soil particles. So mm -hmm. the lead and the arsenic attach themselves to soil particles. So as long as the soil particles don't go anywhere, then the contamination doesn't go anywhere. They stopped using it 70 years ago and you still find the contamination right near the surface of the soils and just hasn't gone anywhere in 70 years. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of human exposure, the problem is um, they call it just incidental ingestion. So if you live on land that's contaminated with these um, soil particles, you will just by virtue of being there, they will get on your hands and then you eat a potato chip, you know, and you put your hand in your mouth um, it gets on things in the house, it gets into the house, it gets in the carpet dust and so forth. You don't want to have infants crawling on the carpet that's now contaminated with this dust. So um, yeah, it doesn't go anywhere. It's stuck to the soil particles, but the soil particles, if you are living on these lands, will eventually, uh, mm -hmm. you know, some of them will make their way into your body through ingestion primarily. Inhalation to a, a much lesser degree. Wind blows mm -hmm. dust around, you breathe it in. Yeah. Yeah, I will say, as Canadians, we wanted to put a public service announcement out there that you should take off your shoes before entering your home, Americans, because uh, yes. you remove some of those pollutants from coming in and being inhaled. That is correct. And I would also point out that uh, the Department of Ecology on their website has a list of things that you can do um, to help mitigate you know, exp the actual exposure. So if it, if it is present on your property and, and there are plenty of homes that are built on old orchard lands, that that's just the way it is right now, it exists, um, but there are things you can do to minimize that. So don't plant a vegetable garden in the native soil you know, on your property, do a raised bed, bring in clean soil you know, and plant your vegetables in that clean soil. And it actually says on the website, vacuum your house more often. So. Uh, <laughs> Some people don't want to clean their house that much, but um, yeah, so the more you can vacuum up that dust, you know, hopefully you have a vacuum cleaner with a very good uh, filtration system on it, so you're not just resuspending it in the air, um, but that's one of the things that they, they list on their website. I don't know if they say taking your shoes off, but it's it's right <laughs> along the same lines. Keep that contamination from coming into your, to your house. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you bringing this up because... Um, I don't think we often think about testing our soil when we move into a new place, but it's a good idea. It's really inexpensive, really straightforward to do. You just take a couple, you know, little bit of soil from different parts, send it into a lab. It costs, you know, maybe 10 bucks or something like that. And then, you know, um, you can also get it tested at the same time, not just for toxins, but also for uh, certain qualities that you want when you're growing plants. So getting your soil tested, I think we should all well, put that as a I, checklist I, item. I, I'm glad you brought that up, actually, because, um, <laughs> hello, um, the Department of Ecology will come out and test your soil for free. Oh. So they actually have a handheld device. It's called an X-ray fluorescence spectrometer. And they can actually just dig a shallow hole and stick this device right up against the dirt. And it gives you an instantaneous reading of the amount of lead and arsenic in there. And so they'll tell you right there. Uh, when they're doing the testing, uh, what they find. So we would, uh, oh, wow. you know, where do you advocate. sign up for that? Um, so again, you go to the Department of Ecology website. Um, they they have a whole series of web pages that are uh, dedicated to legacy orchard lands, and um, and so the contact information is there for for doing that. You actually can just email them. They provide you an email address. Just email the request. They're out here, you know, fairly frequently, you know, on a, on a monthly basis, and they're out here doing that. They come from Yakima, um, but yeah, it's at no cost at all. And uh, so, if you're on old orchard land, um, you know, why not? Right? Why not know if it's an issue or not? Um, and the other thing that Department of Ecology recently put up on a website is actually a map that shows where all of the old orchard land is. Uh, throughout the state of Washington, but you can zoom into the Chelan area 
Um, and so you can actually type in an address. It'll zoom into that. It'll tell you. Based, and they base that on uh, historical aerial photos of the area to see where orchards were and were not located. Hmm. And so it's a way to find out. And it's just part of trying to educate the public, minimize exposure, just to kind of do the right things. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. All right. Well, is Phil around by chance? He is here. Okay. Well, before you go, uh, is there anything else that you wanted to share with us? This is really great information, but how can folks, you know, get involved? It sounds like a lot of your work is related to folks who live in the actual area that you're working. So how can they get involved? Yes. Well, uh, so I would uh, make sure to get out there. It looks like you've got it up there on the screen. You know, go to our website. Uh, we're actually in the process of completely updating our website. So in the next week or so, we'll have a new uh, landing page there. It'll be a lot more informative. Uh, so I think that will be helpful. Um, join Chelan Basin Conservancy. Um, we actually are running a special. If you're down here at Earth Day today, $20 to Early $25. Uh, if you join today, down enter you in a raffle for a really beautiful um, metal print photograph uh, of the upper end of the lake. Um, but yeah, go to our website, learn more. There's ways to contact us through the website. So I'd recommend that. Um, and then I'd also throw out there, we have a currently have a board of four members we're looking for. We'd like to expand that to maybe half a dozen. So if anybody you know really wants to get involved with what we're doing, uh, we'd love to have more people on our board of directors. All right, cool. Well, thank you, Brian. Thanks so much for joining us today and for sharing about all the great resources that um, it sounds like you'll have on your new homepage soon. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me to both of you. You guys have a great day. All right, you too. Thanks. I'll hand this off to Phil. All right, perfect. So we are alluding to our last guest joining us at Chelan Earth Day Fair. We have Phil Long, who is the ED of Lake Chelan Research Institute and okay. Keep It Blue Lake Chelan. Hey, Phil. Hey. Hi. How are How you? How are you? Good. Doing well, thanks. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you all right. Hey, I want to make sure that props work here so you can see Asian clams here, Corbicula fluminea, an invasive species in the lake. Wait, wait, wait. Bring it back yeah, up there. here. Let's, let's get all a right. good inspection. Okay. Yeah, look at that. You can actually see the individual shells. There's my finger for scale. <laughs> These are an invader species, just kind of taken over like Chelan for clams anyway. How did they get here? Um, so the whole Asian clam story is pretty interesting, actually. Um, so it turns out that the first observation was in Nanaimo, BC in 1924, when someone picked up a dead clam shell like the ones I just showed you. After that, it was 1938 in the lower Columbia River. And so um, then they actually begin to spread further south along the coast and then across the southern US and then north again as the climate warmed. So now they occupy lakes and rivers all over the entire North American continent up to a certain degrees north, you know, where it's too cold for them. But yeah, and then eventually they came up the Columbia River. And then once they're in the Columbia, a quick step right up to, they're sometimes transported on the feet of birds, for example, hmm. would be one way they'd get from the Columbia River up, the, up to Lake Chelan. Now, you hear varying stories from people about when they saw them first in Lake Chelan. I never as a kid in the 60s coming to Lake Chelan uh, ever remember seeing a clamshell, but there are people who claim that they were around that time that they were first observed. So certainly in the 70s and 80s, they were here. So anyway, hmm. that's uh, sort of early. I'm, I'm giving away the story here because I want to talk more <laughs> about the State Let's of the Lake it. report, right? Here it is. If you come to our booth at uh, the <laughs> fair, the Earth Day Fair here, you can get your own personal copy. So show up there and uh, and a bunch of other things. So the, the, the thumbnail sketch about water quality uh, in Lake Chelan, this is the first time we've had a report like this since 1987. And it turns out that you cannot tell the difference 
in water quality in the middle of the Wapato Basin. So that would be like halfway between Willow Point Park and the uh, state park in the middle of the lake. You can't tell the difference between water quality in 1987 and today. This is very good news for the lake. So the bulk of the water is very stable in its nutrient content over the years. We know this from a number of measures, the most important of which is the oxygen deficit at the bottom of the lake at the end of the summer. So that's a very sensitive measure to nutrient inputs in the lake. So that's the good news for Lake Chelan. The less good news is that if you talk to anybody who spends time along the lake shore, they will tell you that there's more green stuff growing on the margins of the lake. Attached green algae, it's called paraphyton. And there's more of that than we've ever seen in the past. And in fact, there are some waterfront homeowners who will tell you that just starting a couple of years ago, for the first time ever, they saw this growing on the margins of the lake. And so at, at their dock or their waterfront bulkhead, whatever. Uh, and so that's not really good news. And we're trying to understand why that is. Is it additional nutrient loading? Is it just increasing temperatures? And we're very pleased to let everybody know that going forward in 2022, we recently received a grant from the Icicle Fund to start long-term measurement of temperatures along the lake shore. So we've been measuring temperatures in the middle of the lake monthly for four or five years now. And there's a long history of various temperature measurements in the middle of the lake, but not so much on the margins. And so we'll have eight to 10 locations and wanna actually let waterfront homeowners know that they can volunteer to let us use their pier or their moorings to do this uh, water quality monitoring. We wanna get homeowners involved, citizen science. And this is why um, the Icicle Fund and thank them for this, this grant. Uh, they were interested in doing this because they believe in trying to connect people to place. And so we're excited about that project. So the listeners can, can reach out uh, and uh, to us at, at uh, Lake Chelan Research Institute and we can, I uh, think you probably have, you can pull the contact information for me off the website and let people know that they can volunteer to read this sensor periodically. They can download it once a month or once a quarter <laughs> or whenever. It's, it will log for years, literally, but they can find out what the waterfront temperature or the water margin temperatures are doing. And that's the big question. So we know that in some lakes, if temperature on the margins of the lake increases, that, the, that will increase paraphyton growth. That could be at least part of the explanation, but we wanna make sure that we're not increasing the load of nutrients in the lake along the margins. So anyway, uh, questions that you have uh, going forward at this point? Mm, I read that Lake Chelan is ultra oligotrophic. What does that mean? Okay, so... Um, it means little food, okay? It's um, oligotrophic means that it's just a tiny amount of nutrients in the lake. So in other words, we have some very specific measures from Lake Chelan, and these are described and plotted in the report. So you can look at this. So total phosphorus is one of those measures. We want the lake water concentration of total phosphorus to be less than 4.5 micrograms per liter. That is a very tiny amount of phosphorus. In fact, chemists have a hard time measuring phosphorus at, at that level. So this is what it means. And this is what keeps the lake from turning green, basically. And obviously nobody wants the lake to turn green, right? It's keep it blue, not turn it green. And so we want to make sure that uh, we keep that nutrient load down below this level, 4.5 micrograms per liter. And it's working quite well. It's that way in the middle of the lake. We have done some measurements thanks to help from the rec district at their water intake for their irrigation system. And 
that data for a year showed that we were, we were seeing some spikes in phosphorus. And we don't know if that really accounts for the increased growth of paraphyton, uh, but that's, that's an important uh, measurement and we wanna keep, um, keep an eye on that and the temperature being our first effort. So what we hope happens when we get waterfront homeowners involved in monitoring the temperature is that they say, hey, what else could we learn? What else could we be monitoring? And so that's, that's the, the hope that we have. In fact, down in Lake Tahoe, it's pretty interesting. If you donate $12,000 to uh, Turk, the Tahoe Environmental Research Center, they will build a special nearshore monitoring device, which hmm. measures several parameters and which actually connects in real time to the cell phone system and then you can see the data from those. So that's something that we'd like to get going here as well. So I wanna mention one other thing uh, that we have done um, recently and let's see here if I can find the right sheet. Um, so um, basically what we did was we did, we've completed and you can get this if you look at that uh, at our booth, we've completed an a invasive species survey for the lake in 2021. That has not been quite released yet. It will be released in June, the report of that, was that, that survey. But we're very excited about this because it's the first time we've had any information on the amount of milfoil and curly leaf pondweed and Asian clams growing in the lake uh, that are invasive. That is, they aren't supposed to be here. They weren't here originally, and we need, we probably are going to need to control them just because of the nature of, of what they do. Nobody likes to feel the Eurasian milfoil grabbing at their feet, right, when you're swimming in a bay on Lake Chelan, and that happens in some places. So we're pretty excited about knowing that now, and we now know that we have um, over 400 acres of Eurasian milfoil in the lake. So with that information, what we wanna do in 2022 is actually test what it's gonna to take to remove that using something mm -hmm. called Diver Assisted Suction Harvester or DASH. So DASH is the- put scuba divers with vacuums in there? Yep, that's it, that's how <laughs> it works. And the nice thing about DASH is it doesn't leave bits and pieces of milfoil around, like the kind of things where they chop it up on the surface uh, with a big uh, motor that's turning a giant paddle wheel. This mm -hmm. actually targets each individual plant if necessary, and you can then leave behind the native plants. Uh, they're perhaps, they're usually good. And uh, so unfortunately, there's a lot more uh, milfoil and curly leaf pondweed in the lake than we had anticipated based on an earlier survey. Mm. We don't know exactly how much more because the surveys were so different, but we're very pleased and, and thankful to Four Peaks for doing such a great job on this. Uh, they're an environmental firm out of Wenatchee. We were able to raise 25,000 from private donors and 5,000 contribution from the PUD. So thanks to the private donors and to the PUD, it's very important to, uh, be able to track this and uh, and see what's going on for going forward. So, so Phil, what what is the biggest issue for Lake Chelan's health for you? So, I actually I I believe since we've got the survey done, I'm confident that it is the invasive aquatic plants, and mm. so I just because we have to get a grip on this, we don't want it to become like the Columbia River in some places where it's obviously growing to the surface. Now we have an advantage and the PUD does a great service by generating power in the lake every year by drawing down the water in the winter time. That helps a lot, but clearly we've got an increase in the amount of uh, curly leaf pondweed that's growing and, and Eurasian milfoil. And the nice thing about using DASH, if we can use that as the control method, we're actually removing total organic carbon from the lake. This is what's building up to create the paraphyton in part. And so by that removal, we hope to be able to turn back the clock, if you will, 
in terms of lake water quality, get it back to where it was in the past. So that's what we want to do is just an experiment to figure out what is this area going to have to come up with to, uh, to be able to, you know, in terms of funding, where are we going to get the funding to push back on the growth of aquatic plants so that, you know, we do actually uh, eradicate them or come close to that significant control over time. Interesting. Yeah. So how, how would people stay kind of on the pulse with the work that you're doing? It sounds like you have some new grants to do a little bit more research, understand the problem as it changes as well. How could people follow well, you? So check our website, Lakeshland uh, Research Institute dot org or dot com. And uh, we need we'll, we'll try to keep everything up to date in June. We will put the invasive species survey up online. People will be able to look at that. That'll have access to all the data. And people can go in and zoom in, for example, on their particular part of the lake, how much milfoil is here. And so that's that's one way. The other way is uh, volunteering. Um, we've got lots of work to do, various things going on. Uh, we talked, of course, about the temperature uh, survey and, and logging and monitoring. And so that's a great way for people who have a vested interest, the waterfront homeowners, uh, to, to be involved and uh, help support our efforts. So the other exciting thing you'll see if you come to our booth today, uh, we have our remotely operated vehicle, an ROV, that eventually we want to take to the bottom of the lake. So you can actually see that. We have that at our booth. We can turn the lights on and, uh, and show you a video um, of some of the dives that we've taken. We've just gotten this in operation. And so we're very excited about being able to actually eventually go to the deepest part of Lake Chelan uh, and see what's down there. Now, some people say, Phil, that's gonna be real boring down there, but I just tell them, well, until the, the great white sturgeon swims by, yeah, it might be boring, but then it's all of a sudden gonna be really exciting. So we have a whole list of science that we can do with the remotely operated vehicle. And so we're excited to learn some of the things that uh, we can learn from that uh, and one of them is monitoring the growth of the invasive species, hmm. the aquatic plants that shouldn't be there. And so we can go back to the same spot time and time again during the course of a summer's growing season and sample those plants, see how they're changing. And uh, keep that, that would be one way that we could put that information up on the, up on the web and people could keep track of what's, what's growing out of sight in their lake. So. Okay. Well, that was a great so, seg to remind folks that we are at the Chelan Earth Day Fair at Chelan Riverwalk Park, just right next to downtown Chelan. Uh, there's a ton of stuff going on there from Tammy's veggie starts to your rover that's going to go to the bottom of Lake Chelan and everything in between. Uh, I know that Ann and Randy brought out some electric vehicles. Um, there's a ton of yep. stuff, lots of great swag happening, including we're offering free TSVs. That's fancy talk for thermostatic shower valves that will help you save water and energy free to Chelan County residents. Yep. So come on down if you're in the area and say hi to Phil. He's got he's got some. Cool All right. Hey, we have swag, too. We have uh, drink cozies. We have uh, stickers and all kinds of stuff you could take away, including your very own copy of the State of the Lake Report. So thanks. Cool. Well, thanks, we'll talk Phil. To you thanks later. for joining right. us. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. Whew. Well, thank you all for joining us as we chatted with all of the different folks involved in conservation in the Lake Chelan area. Layla, thank you for joining me as co-host today. I really appreciate it. And good questions. A reminder that April 28th is bring your kid to work so they can do all the exciting fun stuff and the less exciting fun stuff that you do at work. It's a fun way for kids to learn. We will see you next time on the Power Hour. This is May 18th, back to Wednesdays at noon. Megan Kramer, who is a sustainable building specialist and now also works with the Department of Energy and Washington State University. 
um, is going to talk about new construction and how we can make homes that use a lot less energy, uh, yet are still a lot more comfortable and healthy to live in. Aren't you just so excited? <laughs> All right. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.